Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm gonna rearrange this because I am little and I have no torso. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much to the Academy for having me. This is so much better and funner than class. I was saying this is going to be, I think, the most educational experience of my week outside of lecture and section. Um, I realized that I actually have 10 minutes to talk and I was going to actually read two poems. What I'd actually like to do instead is to only read one poem but to have a conversation about how that poem came to be because I was as I was reflecting this morning I realized that that poem's history that it touches upon intersects directly with this Academy as well as with its larger project um, as was mentioned I perform my poetry around the country and uh, one of the most thrilling things I've been able to do is do a few commissioned poems with CBS this morning and they always come at me with these big ass they're like okay Okay, we want you to write a poem and perform it at the top of the Empire State Building and look at a helicopter and don't fall. And I'm like, am I James Bond, but like spoken word poet version? And I end up saying yes and, you know, doing the poem and I don't die and it's all great. Um, but this summer, they actually came with me with quite a big ask, which is to say to write a poem for the 4th of July or celebration of our Independence Day. And I was very nervous to say yes, not because I'd be performing in front of half a million people and it would be live, or I'd be performing with this huge orchestra of the Boston Pops behind me with the legend Keith Lockhart. None of those reasons were really the reasons of why I was horrified. I was so filled with trepidation because I was worried that if I performed this poem that celebrated the founding fathers, I would then be erasing their humanity and their faults, which inform us of our role and our civic duty today. And I did a little bit of thinking and I did my homework and my research. I'm straight A student, so that's what I do. <laughs> and I tried to think more about my role and what it meant to have a young black female poet writing this poem about our founding fathers. And I remembered Phyllis Wheatley, who was a slave who actually lived right here in Boston, who became the first published African-American poet. Now, at her time, you have to imagine this young, skinny, scrimpy girl who begins writing these poems and publishing them, and it sent a ripple throughout the intellectual elite of that time, to the point that this teenage girl is called into a tribunal here in Boston and made to sit in front of 18 white men who are then going to judge by her prowess the role of blacks in arts and science. Now, interestingly enough, part of this 18-man panel was actually John Hancock, one of, these, one of the Academy's founders. And so we don't really know what went down in the room where it happened, but we know that after this tribunal, Phyllis Wheatley leaves with this memento basically claiming that she is the true author for poems, that she does have the intellectual capacity to create art, and that she does have this role in her own poetry and her own authorship. Well. This was not enough for one of the other founding fathers. Never mind that George Washington had also read Phyllis Wheatley's poems and found that they were phenomenal and actually invited her here to Longfellow House, which had been his headquarters. Um, there was another founding father by the name of Thomas Jefferson, who in Notes on the State of Virginia, which is considered to be one of the most important published documents of the 18th century, in which he writes that not only is it impossible for blacks to participate in things like science, but particularly that they don't have the capacity for art, and that it makes no sense that a young black girl could ever write these poems. And so after doing my research and my history, I said, you know what, thank you, Jefferson. I'm going to write this poem. I'm going to do it. And I bring that up not to necessarily harp on the Founding Fathers, but I think that if we were to erase their humanity, then we also erase the huge opportunity that is presented to us all to take up their mantle. And so when I decided to write this poem for CBS, I gave myself a few kind of parameters, which is to say I would recognize 
the gaps that were left in the work of our founding fathers and also the intellectual academy of the time. And I would take that as my own duty and responsibility to pay that forward, to continue the mission, to not look at the American democracy as something that's broken, but to look at it as something that's unfinished. And I think that's something that this convening represents. We all here know that there is work to be done and there is more work to be do. And that's not necessarily something I think that's pessimistic. I think it's actually audacious in the hope that it represents. And so with that in mind, I wrote this poem. Imagine that there's the Boston Pops behind me um, and that we're on the Esplanade and there's fireworks. But it's called Believer's Hymn for the Republic. Twelve score and three years ago, to be exact, our founders dared to declare the world's most revolutionary act a pact sworn for liberty and equality. Out of many was born one people, a teeming nation made of nations at its very foundation, a dream for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today we gather so that our founders' words do not go diminished, but also so that the work does not go un finished, for it's not just a declaration of independence, but the everyday declarations of its descendants that make a people equal. It is our right and our role to remember those words scratched on scrolls so we may live them and heal our nation whole. We roll up our sleeves. We believe in the dream, in these American stories, in the glory of the struggle. For it is our struggle that comes our nation's strength for the lengths we fight for what is right is the fullest measure of our nation's might. And while we cannot shake or cast aside or past, every day we write the future. Together we sign it, together we declare it, we share it. For this truth marches on inside each of us. Americans know one another by our love of liberty when in fact we are liberated by our love for one another. We understand that a house divided cannot stand, so let us make a pact to be the country that acts as compassionate as we are courageous. In the Declaration's pages, we write a new order for the ages. Where out of many, we are one, bright as a sun and bold as an eagle, a nation of all people, by all people, for all people, let this 4th of July move forth or cry to redeem the dream. As we remember those words forever ignited that we have so long heard and recited that we are right to stand, but we are revolutionary when we stand united. Thank you.